Good afternoon and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Neda Galajas. I'm the Senior Associate for European Studies. Um, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to have two very esteemed scholars with us today to discuss a very interesting uh, topic. Um, as you know, we're talking about Ruth Fisher, A Life for and Against Communism from 1895 to 1961. Um, and we have with us here today Mario Kessler, um, who is a member of the Co Center for Contemporary History and an associate professor of history at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Uh, he has been a visiting professor, professor to several American universities, including the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Yeshiva University, uh, and Columbus State University in Georgia. This year, he is the Joan Nordell Fellow at Harvard University's Houghton Library. Um, previously, he has held research fellowships at Johns Hopkins University, King's College London, the German Historical Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, the University of Minnesota, and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Among, among his uh, numerous books and are the biographies of the German refugee scholars Arthur Rosenberg and Osip K. Flesch Fleschtheim, uh, as well as books on the history of German and European labor movements um, and on historiography. Uh, and he'll speak today about his latest project, I guess it's a book project, on the biography of Ruth Fischer. Um, also commentating is uh, Jeffrey Herf, who's a professor of modern European history at the University of Maryland, College Park, and a former uh, fellow at the Woldrow Wilson Center. He's a res his research and teaching focus is on the intersection of ideas and politics in modern European history, especially in 20th century Germany. His publications include Nazi Propaganda for the Arab World, uh, which was published in 2009 by Yale University Press and won the 2010 Bronze Prize of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, uh, other books are The Jewish Enemy, Nazi Propaganda During World War II and the Holocaust, um, and Divided Memory, The Nazi Past in the Two Germanys, uh, both of which have been uh, awarded prizes. Um, he and Mario met uh, in Berlin in 1993 when they were both doing research in the archives of the Central Committee of the Socialist Unity Party. Uh, which was the German communist, the East German communist regime, um, just after those archives had opened. So now we're happy to hear the, the, the fruit of all the work that you've done there. So Maria, I'll give you the floor. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me, um, Jan? So, um, when uh, Christian Ostermann uh, in, uh, invited me, we exchanged our uh, we exchanged our ideas and the topic um, I was supposed uh, to speak, and he, then he told me. Um, if you talk about, if you give a talk about Ruth Fischer, to make it more authentic, can you do it in a German accent? And I told him, uh, how can I do that? I do not have a German accent. <laughs> huh? um, but then, um, but then uh, the uh, colleagues here insisted me, and uh, and so I will not. Um, I hope not to disappoint your expectations. Yeah. So my whole talk, yeah, about forty minutes, will be given in a German accent. Uh, yeah. So. Ruth Fischer, I, um, I entitled it, um, this lecture, A Life for and Against Communism. And I, and I hope to give you um, back information, background information why this title makes sense. Ruth Fischer, 1895 to 1961, once ranking among Germany's and Europe's most prominent women, is today largely forgotten in the English-speaking world. Right after the end of the First World War, she was the co-founder of the Communist Party of Austria, became famous as the chair of the Communist Party of Germany, the KPD, in the Weimar Republic, and after 1945 was associated with the anti-communist crusade in the United States, where she authored the best-selling book Stalin and German Communism. At the end of, of her life, she vainly hoped that the Soviet Union under Nikita Khrushchev would, would move towards a democratic variant of communism. To complete these paradoxes, Ruth Fischer should also be mentioned as the sister of two other prominent Austrian-German communists. The composer Hans Eisler, a disciple and friend of Arnold Schönberg, and the journalist Gerhard Eisler, whom his sister would denounce as Moscow's wire and most dangerous communist agent in the United States. Elfriede Eisler came from a middle-class family. She was born in Leipzig on the 11th of December 19, 1895. The family soon moved to Vienna, where her father held a position as senior lecturer in philosophy at the university. Since Rudolf Eisler, 
who was of Jewish origin, refused to be baptized. He was never promoted to professor. Elfrida's mother Maria, who had worked as a domestic servant until she married, was Protestant. The three children grew, grew up in a liberal and agnostic household. After finishing high school in 1914, Elfrida Eisler studied pedagogy, economics, and philosophy at the University of Vienna. In October 1918, she finished her studies with a degree in social work. In 1914, soon after the war had begun, Elfriede and her brothers, who both were waiting for conscription, founded a left-wing student group that expressed a strict opposition to the war. Another member of the circle was Gerhard Friedländer, a fellow student whom Elfriede married in 1917. In December of the same year, her son Gerhard was born. On the 3rd of November 1918, a group of eight, including Elfriede, her husband and her brothers, founded the Communist Party of Austria. After a failed attempt to gain exclusive leadership of the Austrian communists, she had left Vienna in late August 1919 for Germany. Since then, she took the name Ruth Fischer. While her husband remained in Vienna, Fischer went with, with her son to Berlin. Divorced in 1922, she officially married a member of the Communist Party of Germany, Gustav Golke, a year later to obtain German citizenship, but the marriage remained one of convenience. Soon after her arrival in Berlin, she found a job at the women's office of the party. A few months later, Karl Radek, the Communist International's emissary to Germany, recommended that she should work for the Western European Secretariat of the Communist International, the Comintern. While starting her work as a full-timer, Fischer went into active politics. In December 1920, Ruth Fischer was among the KPD delegates at the conference that merged with the left wing of the Independent Social Democrats, the USPD. Fischer's political activities made her eligible for the post of a chair of the party's district organization of Berlin-Brandenburg, the party's largest provincial branch. She found support from Arkady Maslow, who would soon become Ruth Fischer's lifelong partner. Maslow, 1891-1941, born in the Ukraine under the name Isaac Chemerisky, had abandoned a promising career as a concert pian pianist as well as his university studies in mathematics to devote his whole life to communist politics. As early as November 1920, Maslow was elected to the KPT Central Committee. From 1921, together with Ruth Fischer, he led the Berlin-Brandenburg district organization. In 1921, Maslow also became the foreign affairs editor of the party's central daily newspaper, Die Rote Fahne. The left-wing faction around Fischer and Maslow became known as the, as the Berlin Opposition. In November and December of 1922, Fischer participated in the Fourth World Congress of the Comintern in Moscow, where she met Lenin and Trotsky. In an unofficial meeting that was arranged between the German Congress delegation and the Soviet party leadership, she spoke in her own words vehemently and brutally against the policy of the German Central Committee, uh, Committee attacked the new economic policy ir irreverently and criticized the Russian Communist Party without the servile attitude of deference toward Lenin that had already become habitual with all foreign communist leaders. Consequently, Neither Fischer nor Maslow would obtain seats in the new KPD directorate, directorate, the Zentrale. Control over affairs passed into the hands of Heinrich Brandler and August Thalheimer. Brandler in particular soon realized that the vast majority of German workers refused to be dragged into adventures without any purpose or sense. Throughout 1921-22, the moderate and the leftist tendency were both seeking support from the Comintern headquarters in Moscow. During the summer of 1923, riots and strikes against the galloping inflation erupted all over Germany. Hundreds of thousands participated. There were serious differences within the KPD about how to deal with this situation. The rightist group around the party chair Heinrich Brandler stood by their view that workers' governments on the state and local level should be formed. However, the KPD leadership attempted to join the left social democratic governments in the states of Saxony and Thuringia came under a baptism of fire by the group around Fischer and Maslow. 
They saw Germany as mature enough for revolution and criticized sharply what they called the reformist passivity of the circle around Brandl. In both states, Saxony and Thuringia, the KPD joined left-wing SPD governments on October 10th and 16th respectively. respectively. As early as 21st of August, the Russian party leadership decided to prepare for a revolution in Germany. The date of the uprising was set on the, for the 9th of November. With the support of German President Friedrich Ebert, the army stepped up their pressure against Saxony and Thuringia and issued a direct order banning the proletarian um, hundreds, the armed military units of the KPD, giving those three days in which to give up their arms. The ultimatum was ignored. On the 21st of October, the army entered Saxony. The KPD had to bring forward its plans for insurrection. It called a Congress of Factory Councils in Chemnitz, Saxony, on 21st of October. This Congress was supposed to call a general strike and give the signal for the German October Revolution. But because the left SPD delegates disagreed, Brandler called off the uprising. He also saw that the proletarian hundreds were not well enough equipped with arms. This decision did not reach Hamburg in times. Here, a communist interaction was organized, but it remained isolated and was quickly put down. For a few months, to the KPD, together with the Nazi party after its ill-fated Bierhoputsch in Munich, was outlawed, a decision that was, was revoked on the 1st of March 1924. The end of the illusions for a German October Revolution was a major setback for international communism. The reaction of the Comintern leadership was to condemn the KPD leaders. The new turn of the left was in part a spontaneous reaction of KPD members against the so-called betrayal of the right rightists, that means the leadership around Brandler. But it was also determined, determined by a regrouping of political forces in Moscow, where Stalin and no longer Fischer's ally Zinoviev took over political control. In April, the KPD held its ninth Congress in Frankfurt Main. After tumultuous debates, the victory of the left was decisive. Fischer, Maslow and Werner Scholem, another proponent of the left, constituted the new political secretariat. Among its members were Ernst Thälmann, the leader of the defeated Hamburg uprising, and the historian Arthur Rosenberg. The radical jurist Karl Korsch became editor of the Internationale, the party's theoretical journal. They were all supporters of Fischer and Maslow. Finally, Ruth Fischer was appointed chair of the party with Maslow as co-chair. Co Throughout 1924, a pro process of consolidation in Germany followed the crisis. The parliamentary elections of the 4th of May were, however, still largely influenced by the recent turmoil. The KPD came in fourth place, polling around 3.7 million votes, 12.6% of the electorate, and sent 62 deputies to the parliament, among them Ruth Fischer. In her inaugural speech, Fischer called the parliament a shadowy theater. A few months later, she described the parliamentarians as puppets of the heavy industry. The KPD was in staunch opposition of the government and the Doris plan that had softened the burden of allied war reparations, stabilized the economy and brought increased foreign investment and loans to the German market. The party thus came into conflict with general public opinion. Consequently, the next elections that were held in December 1924 turned out unfavorably for the party. The number of votes for its candidates fell to 2.7 million, 8.9%, giving the party only 45 seats. Fischer retained her seat. The political isolation of the Soviet Union and the temporary stabilization of capitalism in Europe, namely in Germany, strengthened the position of the Soviet party bureaucracy, particularly that of Stalin. It was Stalin who became the main proponent of the new slogan of socialism in a single country. That slogan could well be seen as an ideological justification for the growing power of the state and party apparatus. It was the Comintern Turn Chair Zinoviev, Fischer supporter, who announced at the 5th Comintern Congress that the great slogan of the coming period was the Bolshevization of the communist parties. The thesis on tactics adopted by the Congress defined Bolshevization 
as the transfer to our sections of everything in Bolshevism that has been and is still of international significance. It was emphasized that every communist party must be a centralized party, prohibiting factions, tendencies or groupings. It must be a monolithic party cast in a single block. Ruth Fischer called for a monolithic Comintern according to the Russian party model from which all dissent should be banished. This, would Congress, this World Congress should not allow the international to be transformed into an agglomeration of any kind of currents, as she said. It should fork ahead and embark upon the road that leads to a single Bolshevik World Party. The KPD delegation endorsed this policy and also the position of the Congress that declared that fascism and social democracy are the left hand and right hand of modern capitalism. Nevertheless, Ruth Fischer gradually realized that she had, had to abandon the more extreme manifestations that were declared in the name of the party. In February 1925, the KPD leadership dismissed Korsch as the editor of the Internationale. On the 27th of May 1925, the leadership attempted to come closer to the SPD by addressing an open letter that proposed some kind of cooperation. In July, the 10th KPD conference in Berlin would ratify the shift away from ultra-leftist orientation. Nonetheless, Fischer's leadership was seen in Moscow with growing skepticism. It was suspected that she and Maslow would no longer be able to keep the party affairs under control. The strong opposition that Dmitry Manuilsky, the Eki emissary, had faced at the Congress, he was loudly advised as to go back to Moscow, was seen as proof for Fischer's dwindling leadership quality. The Manuelski affair played a pivotal role at the meeting of the German Commission of the, the Eki, the Executive Committee of the Comintern, with the KPD leaders on the 12th of August in Moscow. Fischer and Maslow were told that the party needed trustworthy proletarian elements such as Ernst Hellmann, Stalin's supporter. He was considered to represent a policy that should guarantee the rootedness of the KPD among the proletarian masses. An open letter of the Eki that was published in September 1925 confirmed this statement. It emphasized that only under a proletarian leadership would the KPD be able to practice a Leninist policy that deserves its name. The letter stated that it, it is not the left in the KPD that is bankrupt, but certain leaders of the left that obviously meant Fischer and Maslow. Demonstrating the party discipline expected from every communist, the letter was signed by all KPD delegates in Moscow. That included Fischer, who, in her own words written decades later, was driven to sign my own political death warrant and to confess my sins in public. Much later she wrote, I have signed the open letter for the sake of preserving the iron unity in the Russian Politburo. An extraordinary party conference that was held in Berlin on 23rd of October and 1st of November confirmed the new situation. Fischer and Maslow were expelled from the party directorate. Ernst Thälmann's undisputed leadership documented in its essence Stalin's dominance over the German party after his victory over Zinoviev in the Soviet Union. The key position in the party passed from intellectuals to men of impeccable proletarian origin. At this time, Wood Fischer was still in Moscow. According to an unofficial order given by Stalin, she was not allowed to leave the country but had to stay in the Comintern Hotel Lux. The Six Eki plenum, plenum confirmed the resolutions of the previous meetings and endorsed that the current leadership of the KPD could well be considered as guarantee for a Leninist policy. The dismissed leaders, and in particular Fischer and Maslow, were depicted as typical proponents of anti-communism. Wood Fischer was able to return to Berlin only after a stiff fight for her passport in order to get out of Russia. Shortly after her return, she should only register. Shetty and Maslow were denounced as renegades and expelled from the KPD on the 19th of August 1926. After her expulsion from the party, Ruth Fischer held her parliamentary mandate until the elections of May 1928. 
Together with nine other parliamentary representatives, all were ex-members of the KPD, she formed a group of left communists, the Gruppe Linker Kommunisten. Among them were Ar Arkady Maslow, Werner Scholem, and Hugo Urbans, another activist of the leftist tendency and also Kankosch. After a year of political isolation and a series of meetings between those who had been expelled from the KPD, a new leftist communist organization was founded in Berlin in April 1928, the Lenin Bund. Among its founders were Fischer and Maslow. Both did not remain in this party, which had approximately 6,000 members for very long. Its position can be summarized as follows. The Lenin, the Lenin Bund argued that the October Revolution had run its full course and that the Soviet Union would be in a state of counter-revolution. The ruling bureaucracy had itself transformed into a new class based on state capitalism of a nationalized economy. Nevertheless, on 8th of May 1928, the Eki Presidium offered to pardon all, all Leninwood members if they would condemn immediately the activity of the fischer maslow urbans group as anti-proletarian and counter-revolutionary, and retire immediately from the Bund and demand the dissolution of the organization. Maslow and Fischer themselves accepted this proposition, withdrew from the Leninbund and asked to be readmitted to the KPD. The application was turned down. After their parliamentary mandate ended in May 1928, Fischer and Maslow had to look for jobs. While Maslow could earn a modest income by tutoring high school students in mathematics and by making translations, Fischer returned to her profession as a social worker. The magistrate of the city the district of Berlin-Prenzlauer Berg employed her. Fischer collected a great amount of empirical facts about the living conditions of workers and their children. This condition became extremely difficult during the years of the Great Depression since 1929. Ruth Fischer documented the rising difficulties for workers in a book that she jointly published with Franz Heimann, a pediatrician. The book, Deutsche Kinderfibel, German's Children's Primer, came out just a few weeks before the Nazis gained power. On the 25th of August, 1933, Ruth Fischer appeared as the only woman on the first list of persons whom the Nazis deprived of their German citizenship. On this date, Ruth Fischer had already left Germany. She managed to smuggle her 15 years old son, who had briefly been in the hands of the Gestapo, despite his Austrian passport out of Germany. He went to England, where he studied mathematics in Cambridge to become a profession, prof, professional researcher. Fischer and Maslow left Germany illegally. After a brief stay in Prague, they went to Paris. From October 1934 until September 1939, Ruth Fischer worked as a municipal social worker in the city of Saint-Denis, near Paris. She continued her social investigations on children from working class families. Officially divorced since 1929, she received French citizenship through another marriage of convenience, this time with, sh with the shoemaker Edmond Blechot, whom she married in 1935. Politically, Fischer came in temporary cl close contact with Leon Trotsky. Fischer and Maslow traveled frequently to Trotsky's home in Barbizon. Fischer became a good friend of Trotsky's son, Leon Zyadov, but the conversations with the father showed unchangeable political differences. Unlike Trotsky, Fischer insisted that no political reform could restore the role of the working class in the Soviet Union. Only another revolution would achieve that. Fischer and Maslow felt, as Trotsky argued, no solidarity with the Soviet Union. In return, Fischer said that Trotsky's interpretation of the Soviet regime as a degenerated worker state would make critical communists incapable of understanding the character of Stalin's success and would even make Nazism and its consequences for the workers ununderstandable. <coughs> In August 1936, the first Moscow trial accused Fischer and Maslow of terrorist activities against the Soviet Union. The main charge was forming a terrorist organization with the purpose of killing Stalin and other members of the Soviet party leadership. On the 24th of August 1936, the 13 defendants, including Zinoviev, were executed. On the 10th of May 1940, the German army invaded France. 
Fischer and Maslow left Paris on the 11th of June, three days before the German army arrived. They lost all the possessions that they had taken with them from Germany. Under extremely difficult circumstances, they managed to flee to Marseille. There, they tried to get, tried to get American visas, but without success. With fast Danish passports, they had to cross the border to Spain illegally and went through Spain to Lisbon, to Portugal and to Lisbon. But it was only Fischer who got a US visa. Maslow's application was repeatedly denied. There was nothing else to do but to separate. In April 1941, Fischer boarded a ship to New York, arriving on the 21st. Maslow went to Cuba, the only place where he could go. He was unable to obtain an entry visa to the United States. On the 20th of November 1941, Maslow was found dead in Havana. According to an official investigation, he had suffered a heart attack. However, Ruth Fischer was and remained of the opinion that Maslow was murdered by Stalin's secret police agent, agents. As my following biography will hopefully show, her assumption was right. Until Maslow's sudden death, Ruth Fischer lived a quiet life in New York, where she found help from several friends. For a very brief time, she was employed as a social worker. After Maslow's death, she was ill for more than a year and confined to bed for about six months. Maslow had been the great love of her life. And since his passing, she never wanted to live with another man. But Ruth Fischer had to make a living, and therefore she wrote a number of, of applications for research grants. In October 1942, she received a one-year grant from the Emergency Committee in aid of displaced foreign scholars. For another year, she received support from the Institute of International Education, which was sponsored by the AFL. In 1942 and 43, Ruth Fischer visited her brother Hans and his wife Lou Eisler in California. But in 1944, she came to the conclusion that her brothers, especially Gerhard, were part of the Stalinist campaign against Arkady Maslow and herself. On the 27th of April 1944, she addressed a letter to Gerhard, Hans and Lou. In this letter, she accused them of having reported every single fact about Maslow's life circumstances to the GPU apparatus in Moscow. I believed for a moment that the Russian-German treaty 1939-41 would really have separated you from the apparatus. For a moment, I lived with the illusion that people with such a deep insight into the brutality of the system of terror and oppression would be unable to return to it. She would fight until the end and would inform the public about the network of conspiracy against herself. She would especially expose Gerhard's 15 years of aggression against her comrades in China, Germany, Spain, and the United States. With financial assistance from the American Federation of Labor, Ruth Fischer started to publish The Network, a mimi mimeographed circular journal. The opening article in the first issue was entitled Who is who among the free Germans in the United States? It tried to explain that the hierarchy of the German Communist Party, including its exile organization, had become a division of the GPU, led by the Russian agents and tools. German communists would still profit from the prestige of the party founders Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, who once had attracted many of the best of the German working class. By the end of 1946, the United States House of Representatives had, had resurrected the House Un-American Activities Committee, the HUAC, which it had originally set up in 1938. The committee started its activities with what would become known as the Eisler-Fischer affair. Since the mid-1920s, Gerhard Eisler had been a leading functionary in the KPD and in the Comintern. Between 1929 and 1931, he was a liaison between the Comintern and the Communist parties in China, and then from 1933 to 1996 in the United States. During the Spanish Civil War, he directed a German anti-fascist radio station. In 1939, he was incarcerated in France for more than two years. In 1941, he returned to the United States. There, he was instrumental in forming the Council for a Democratic Germany, also the official head was a Protestant theology professor Paul Tillich. 
As early as the 6th of May 1944, Ruth Fischer informed the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the predecessor or one of the predecessors of the CIA about the activities of the Council. Based on her, on her information, the OSS collected a very detailed survey on political activities of foreign national groups in the United States. The survey explicitly stated that anti-Stalinists, of whom Ruth Fischer is the most notable, are more most valuable informers. It also warned of communist and pro-communist activities among former German soldiers in POW camps. However, an FBI memorandum of, of, memorandum of 29th of May 1944 stated that Eisler was not himself associated with the GPU, as he is too well educated. At the same time, Wood Fischer's, uh, Wood Fischer's attack on her brother appeared in the net network. She exposed him as the man who directed, under the pseudonym Hans Berger, the international communist activities in the United States. On the 17th of November 1944, FBI Director J. Ed J. Edgar Hoover wrote in a letter to the legal attaché of the American Embassy in Lisbon that Eisler has been identified as an agent of the Comintern, and his wife Brunhilde likewise has a record of international communist activity. This investigation had no consequences as long as the United States and the Soviet Union were military allies to defeat Nazism. But the political climate in the United States changed drastically after the end of the war as Soviet-American relations deteriorated. During that time, officially in 1942, a secret service that was, what was informally called DIPONT was founded in order to gather information about Nazi activities, but also very soon about international communism. Since research about the secret service is still in the beginning, it should only be noted here that Ruth Fischer, under the codename Alice Miller, became a valuable source for the punt that operated under the directorship of Colonel John Grumbach, a radio producer, businessman, businessman, former Olympic boxer and sports historian. Fischer worked for this organization until it was dissolved in 1954. It was in this new Cold War clima climate when Fischer described Gerhard Eisler as head of the German communists in the Western Hemisphere and as one of the key agents of the communist apparatus here and one of the key figures in the American Communist Party. She was now presented in the press as a former rat who should know. On 24th of January 1947, Fischer was interviewed by an FBI special agent in her New, in her New York apartment. She gave him detailed information about Eisler's role in the KPD and the Comintern and his political background. At the same time, the American ex-communist Louis Pudens former managing editor of the CP newspaper Daily Worker named Eisler as Moscow's number one communist in the United States. Under the pretext that Eisler had violated American laws by misrepresenting his Communist Party affiliation on his immigration application, he was arrested on the 4th of February 1947 in New York. On the 6th of February, he was asked to testify before the HUAC. J. Pondell Thomas, the committee's chairman, explained to Eisler that it considers the Communist Party of the United States to be a subversive organization and the testimony or activities of, my individual, of any individual connected with the Communist Party of the United States is considered to be the purview of this committee, committee's authority. Eisler declared that he considered himself a political prisoner of the United States. Therefore, he refused to be sworn in until he was allowed to make a few remarks on his behalf. The committee refused and decided instead that Eisler should be cited for contempt and that he should be brought to the county jail of Washington, D.C. Immediately, after Eisler's interrogation, Wood Fisher took the witness stand. She became the key fig figure in the case against her brother, whom she characterized as head of the Comintern activities in this country, or, to put it better, as the head of a network of agents of the secret Russian state police. The chief investigator Robert Stripling asked Fischer to inform the committee of her biography, particularly how she came to the communist movement and also of her brother's communist activities. She told him that the relationship to her brother Gerhard, be Gerhard became, after her expulsion from the KPD, more and more hostile. 
to the point where I, where I am forced to testify against him today because I regard him as the most dangerous terrorist both in the people of America. Fisher went as far as to claim that her brother had a leading hand in the murder of Bukharin, of the German communist Hugo Eberlein, and in transferring communist in inmates from Stalin's to Hitler's prison cells in 1940. Eisler denied this vehemently and emphasized that he was, at the time of Maslow's death, in a French concentration camp, although he already lived in the United States. After his arrival in New York on the 13th of June 1941, he had been interned at Ellis Island, Island but was released in September. Richard Nixon, the name is well known here, one of the committee's members asked Ruth Fischer whether she still might have some sympathy with the Marxist philosophy and the ends which communism attempts to achieve, while she would not agree with Stalin's methods to achieve those ends. Ruth Fischer's answer was, at this moment, what we have to face is an empire of Stalin going into many countries. We have to fight his terrorist methods and do everything in our power to hinder that movement. Fischer ended by informing the committee that her relationship with her brother Hans was equally hostile and that there were several thousands of communists in the United States who were controlled by Moscow. On the 16th of June, Wood Fischer testified in the Washington District Court that her brother had been sent to the United States in order to revamp the idiotic communist party line here. She denounced him as a most dangerous terrorist and the perfect terrorist type. Two other ex-members of the American Communist Party stated that Eisler had called, called up American communists to work for an independent Negro Republic, Republic, as it was called. As a man from Moscow, as Eisler was described, he had lived in a world where honor, friendship, even family ties meant nothing. The same could be said about Ruth Fischer long after she had left the world of Moscow and fought against her brother, I think. In September 1947, Hans Eisler was interrogated by the HUAC. The interrogation effects were the same, efforts were the same. It was proven that he was an organized communist, that he had been a member of the KPD, and that he had cooperated with communist organization in both the Soviet Union and the United States. As a result of his close connection to Bertolt Brecht, the dramatist also had to appear before the committee on the 30th of October 1947. As early as 1944, Ruth Fischer had stopped Brecht, with whom she had once been a good friend in Berlin, a minstrel of the GPU. She denounced his play, Die Maßnahme, the disciplinary measure, which Brecht had written in collaboration with Hans Eisler and published in 1931 as an anticipation of the Stalinist purchase. Few, if any, events at that time were reported in the American press more cautiously and as detailed as Fischer's testimony. It was her judgment of the disciplinary measure that figured prominently in Brecht's appearance before the House Committee, where Robert Stripling quoted several passages from the play. Gerhard Eisler was sentenced to one to three years in prison, but soon released on bail. When his last legal appeal failed, he jumped bail and secretly boarded a Polish liner bound for London in May 1949. He was discovered by the crew only after the ship was at sea. Once in England, authorities allowed him to leave for East Germany. Brecht went to East Berlin as well. On the 10th of May 1949, Ruth Fischer testified before the Subcommittee on Immigration and Naturalization of the Senate Committee of the, of the Judiciary. The chair of the Subcommittee was a pro-fascist Senator Patrick McCarran, who had been a left-wing activist in his youth, but later persistently expressed his vehement support for dictators like Franco. Fischer warned them not to underestimate the small American Communist Party, which she described as a direct tool of the Soviet embassy. Several thousand people, basically every American communist, were being trained in sabotage. With the help of American fellow travelers, thousands of foreign communists had come to the United States and been given fat jobs, while in many cases ex-communists would not be allowed to visit the country. Fischer proposed a friendly cooperation with those who have learned from their personal experience that Stalinism is the most reactionary power in the world and want to fight it. Every effort should be made to keep out, and if they slip in to deport the actual actions of a foreign power, while contrawise, ex-communists who had broken completely and definitely with their former convictions 
should be given the chance to freely enter the United States. Among those persons who had been given a, an American visa that they then used for communist subversion were, according to Fischer, Marie Vaillant Couturier, General Secretary of the Communist Monster International Women's Federation, the physicist and Nobel Prize winner Irene Joliot-Curie, and Hermann Buczyslawski, now a professor in Leipzig. Furthermore, I quote her, Heinrich and Thomas Mann are saints of the communist family. Erika Mann was, I must even say, an agent for a pro-communist Germany, and Alfred Kantorowicz was officially a liaison officer for the International Brigade in Spain, but was in fact a GPU agent. McCarran said to Fischer that we are very grateful to you for coming before the committee. It was the same McCarran who became, in September 1950, the chief sponsor of the Internal Security Act. Under this act, which Congress pass, passed, passed over President Truman's veto, millions of Americans in and out of government would be subjected to loyal clearance programs that included intensive investigations into their political and private and even sexual lives reaching back to childhood. In 1948, Fischer published her book Stalin and German Communism at Harvard University Press. It was the first full-fledged story of the German Communist Party of Germany in English and provoked much attention. In some of her historical judgments, Fischer corrected her political mistakes from the 1920s, but she neglected her own role in the process when she wrote that only since the defeat of Ruth Fischer and her opposition and up until 1948, anyone who was accepted into the apparatus was admitted because his record showed a long period of subservience to Stalin's Russia. The apparatus had effectively destroyed the KPT that Fischer, in her own words, had helped to build up. Her book secured Fischer's material situation. The Widener Library offered her a permanent post as consultant and reviewer of recent literature on communism and the labor movement. She held this position until she moved to Paris in 1955. After her application for American citizenship was approved in 1947, Fischer remained an, an American citizen until the end of her life. In August 1949, she was one of the initiators of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, but did not participate in the West Berlin opening session. She may not have wanted to risk coming so close to the Soviet-controlled territory of East Berlin. In 1967, it was revealed that the association was largely sponsored by the CIA. After Stalin's death, on the 5th of March 1953, Wood Fischer anticipated that the new Soviet leadership would continue to control the international communist movement, but would be forced to refrain from Stalin's openly terroristic methods. But it was Nikita Khrushchev's so-called secret speech at the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party in February 1956 that, while not fundamentally changing Soviet society, had indeed wide-ranging effects. The speech was a factor in unrest in Poland and revolt in Hungary later in 1956, and it was also a turning point in Ruth Fischer's political evolution. In 1954, Ruth Fischer asked the West German government for financial compensation. According to the German federal compensation law, she belonged to those persons who were victimized under the Third Reich. That included individuals who were persecuted for political, racial, religious, or ideological reasons. Her application for a permanent financial compensation was, however, finally denied in October 1954 by the West German Ministry of the Interior on the grounds that Fischer had, during her time as a communist politician in the Weimar Republic, tried to undermine the liberal democratic constitution as defined by the basic law of the Federal Republic of Germany. This final judgment by the West German authorities evoked Fischer's deep doubts in a working liberal democracy where former Nazi bureaucrats, like any other civil servants, received high pension. Although she increasingly wished to live in Europe, she decided not to return to Germany. Likewise, she regarded Austria, at that time still under partial Soviet control, as an unsuitable place for life. When she left the United States for Paris in 1955, she remained employed by the Widener Library at that time as an external reviewer of contemporary political literature. To upgrade her income, she traveled frequently to West Germany, where sh she received invitations mostly by social, democratic, or trade union circles to speak about current political affairs. Since Stalin's death, and I come to the end, the tone in which Fischer delivered her speeches became more moderate, much more moderate than in previous years. 
This was reflected in her new book from Lenin to Mao, Communism in the Bandung Era, that she published in 1956. In this book, she even stated that McCarthyism represents a specific American variant of Stalinism, without mentioning her own role in the anti-communist campaign of the late 1940s. After Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, Ruth Fischer came to the conclusion that the time of Stalinist show trials and the organized terror was definitely over. She interpreted the internal development of the Soviet Union as a struggle between pro- and anti-Stalinists. While the former would still be retaining power positions in the propaganda apparatus, their influence in politics, ec economy, and the military would be dwindling. A retreat towards Stalinism would be irreversible, and Khrushchev, despite his Stalinist past, would guarantee this irreversibility. Even the Soviet invasion in Hungary would not lead to a relapse of Stalinist terror, but would remain a very short episode. She explained her new optimism in a small book that measured the transformation of Soviet society since Stalin. From 1957, Fischer Lecture shot at the Sorbonne on the politics of contemporary communism and predicted a Soviet move toward democracy. In private conversations, he went even further. Isaac Deutscher, whom Fischer met in London in late 1956, was astonished about the transformation. He wrote to his friend Heinrich Brandler, I have seen Ruth Fischer several times recently. She expressed to me her regret over the attitude she had taken in previous years, admitted that she was wrong in many respects and in general speak, spoke quite sensibly about the situations as if the conscience of an old communist had suddenly reawakened in her. In her. Deutscher concluded, the renegade becomes a heretic again. One reason for Ruth Fischer to find a new political position was for personal reasons. After years of enmity, Fischer wanted to re-establish contact with her brothers who live in East Berlin. Ruth Fischer's nephew Georg Eisler, Hans Eisler's son, who worked as a painter in Vienna, wrote her in 1958, at which time she, up, she asked him about the family after he had visited them in East Berlin. He could only say that he was unable to ask Gerhard and Hans under present conditions which are completely unsuitable to, dis to discuss the matter. Fischer consi considered the unique and specific problems of the DDR as part of a divided country and had therefore refrained from open criticism of Ulbricht's policy, as she told Klaus Meschkart, <coughs> a young student from West Berlin who visited her in Paris on 12th of March 1961. He was scheduled to visit her again the next day. When he called her to confirm the appointment, the secretary told him that Ruth Fischer had unexpectedly died after midnight, a few hours after Meshkart had left her. Her brothers Hans and Gerhard were deeply moved when they received the information about Ruth Fischer's death. The eyes lost die out was Gerhard's only commentary. Ruth's son confirmed that during the last years of her life, his mother saw herself as a communist without party affiliation. She was buried at Montparnasse Cemetery. Only a handful of people attended her funeral service. Ruth Fischer seemed to be forgotten. But only a few hours after her death, her Paris apartment was checked and photographed by French Secret Service policemen. This incident shows that her attempted return to the communist cause, although not believed by many communists, was not ignored by those who once had adored the protagonist of anti-communism. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear some comments from, uh, from Jeffrey. Mario Kessler's paper draws on Ruth Fisher's mm -hmm. um, manuscripts mm -hmm. and uh, uh, letters uh, from exile and also uh, from fairly recently released files mm -hmm. of at the FBI and the CIA uh, and uh, tells us a great deal about Ruth Fisher's life and her politics. Uh, the question I want to pose is, is it important that we know a lot about Ruth Fisher? Um, is uh, Ruth Fisher, I've not read Stalin and German Communism for many years, uh, her book about uh, the Weimar Republic and the Communist Party. I've not read her book about uh, from the 1950s. So I, I'm not in a position to evaluate if Ruth Fisher is one of those um, uh, great intellectuals of Europe's 20th century who wrote profound and interesting things about about um, 
politics, in particular uh, communist politics. Uh, if 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 there is, if if we should read, if we should think of Fisher as uh, as we we do uh, about uh, say Arthur Kessler or Raymond Aron or, uh, um, uh, so I'm uh, from what what I've read in the paper that Mario has delivered. Uh, I conclude that, at least from what I've seen here, the answer is no, uh, that Ruth mm -hmm. Fisher is, is not one of the great intellectuals of Europe's 20th century. But there is a story here about love and truth-telling, <laughs> which I think is at the core. <laughs> yeah, sure. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, first of all, um, uh, the... Um, uh, Ruth Fisher, the, the, in the paper, uh, I know Mario well, so I'm not going to call him Professor Kessler. <laughs> uh, uh, um, we received some glimpses of what uh, uh, Ruth Fisher believed and did as the leader of the Communist Party, uh, the German Communist Party in 1924 and 1925. Um, she attacked, as you heard, she attacked the, uh, the parliament of Germany's uh, first uh, republic as a shadowy theater and she denounced its members as puppets of heavy industry. She opposed the Dawes Plan, which, as uh, many of you know, played a very important role in stabilizing the, Weimar, the economy of the Weimar Republic. If it hadn't been for the Depression, Nazism wouldn't have happened as a government. Uh, but she attacked the Dawes Plan. In short, uh, she emerges as one of those communists who attacked Germany's first democracy when it needed supporters most. And the German Communist Party has, as one of its accomplishments, helping to destroy the Weimar Republic. It didn't have the primary responsibility for that. We know, of course, that that was the, the, uh, the achievement of the Nazi Party and, and those, uh, those conservative elites who invited it into power. But nevertheless, it didn't help. As far as the relationship between the German Communist Party and the Soviet Union was concerned, um, in the 1920s, she, re she expressed remarkably uh, authoritarian and Stalinist views, as Mario just articulated. She called for a monolithic, monolithic common turn composed of centralized parties that prohibited factions. At the Fifth Common Turn Congress of 1925, and I'm just repeating a few of the things that Mario pointed out to you, she said, this World Congress should not allow the international to be transformed into an agglomeration of any kind of currents. It should forge ahead and embark upon the role that leads to a single Bolshevik world party that is one led by headquarters of the Comintern in Moscow. So Ruth Fisher is not Rosa Luxemburg. She's not an anti-authoritarian leftist who is uh, denouncing uh, Leninism. She was a good Leninist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, further, she endorsed the, comment, the fifth uh, uh, com commentary in Congress position that fascism and social democracy are the left hand and the right hand of modern capitalism. And this has got to be one of the stupidest and greatest blunders of 20th century politics uh, uh, advocated by any major political organization in the world. Um, and she advocated it. Um, along with uh, Arkady Maslow, Werner Scholem, by the way, Gershom Scholem's brother, and Arthur Rosenberg, she represented the ultra-left of the Cape Day in uh, the crisis years of the Weimar Republic, and she was among those taking the lead in attacking social democrats as reformists and supporting the Bolshevization of the German Communist Party. It is, um, uh, here is a case uh, in, in light of her expulsion from the Communist Party several years later of a political figure, one of many in the history of communism, who suffered uh, as a result of the ideas that she fo fostered and the institutions that she helped to create. But this was not all that Ruth Fisher said or did. She combined left-wing communism with anti-French German nationalism and with anti-Semitism. And one of the most famous things that Ruth Fisher ever said, um, she said in 1923 in July, mm -hmm. according to a report in the Social Democratic paper Forbarts at a communist rally in Berlin, she denounced capitalism, the Jews, and France in the following terms. 
Those who attack Jewish capital are already part participants in the class struggle, their Klassenkampfer, even if they don't know that that's what they are. They're against Jewish capital, and they want to beat it down. Um, they want to beat down these stock exchange crooks, and they're right in doing so. Stamp on the Jewish capitalists. Hang them from the lampposts. Trample on them. But what is your stance about the big capitalists like Stinnis and Kluckner, gentlemen from the populist nationalist part of the political spectrum, the Folkerson side? It is only an alliance. It is only in an alliance with Russia that the German people can drive French capitalism out of the Ruhr. Um, this this anti-Semitic rant uh, was. Um, uh, a number of historians have referred to it, Werner Ongres in The Stillborn Revolution, uh, Heinrich August Winkler in his uh, superb of Weimar, 1918-1933, Edmund Silberner in Communist und Judenfrage, and I know that the Mario has done very, very brave and very important work on anti-Semitism uh, in uh, East Germany, and he's certainly familiar with this. Yeah. Uh, this outburst was a classic example of the blend of left-wing nationalism, anti-capitalism, and, and the kind of anti-Semitism that has been a current in the Marxist tradition since Marx identified the Jews in a pejorative sense with capitalism in his essay of the 1840s on the Jewish question. Um, uh, Mario Kessler writes that Fisher realized she had to abandon these more extreme positions. And so as I, I have not had time to reread Stalin and German communism or her subsequent writings while preparing these comments, I'd be interested to know if she reassessed or even acknowledged her own anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and attacks on liberal democracy in the 1920s. Um, her replacement with Talman as leader of the, of the Communist Party meant that the key positions in the party passed from intellectuals to men of impeccable proletarian origin. And in a tragic, common sequence of, tragic comic sequence of events, she and Maslow were denounced as renegades, proponents of anti-communism, and then expelled. These renegade anti-communists then formed two more organizations of left-wing communism, the Group of Left Communists and the Leninbund, only to agree to condemn their own activities as anti-proletarian and counter-revolutionary in a failed effort to be readmitted to the Cape Day. Um, here I'm going to allow myself a, a, an opinion. Mm -hmm. It's episodes like this that have led me to conclude long ago that were it not for Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 and the prestige that the Red Army acquired due to its role in defeating Nazi Germany, that communism in Europe would have collapsed long before 1989. Uh, probably nobody did as much as Hitler um, and then the banner of anti-fascism arrayed against him to give European communism a life beyond the 1930s. Uh, the um, history of the de-radicalization of European intellectuals, both of the far left and the far right, has become a key theme uh, of 20th century European uh, intellectual history. In many of these cases, broad intellectual issues intersect with the very personal for obvious reasons. If people become involved in extremist organizations, sooner or later, they see what the translation of theory into practice means in real life, in their own lives, not just in the lives of other people. Ruth Fisher's evolution is an example of this phenomenon. Following the expulsion and denun her, denun her, the, following her expulsion and then denunciation as a terrorist in Moscow, she was one of the lucky ones who got out of Nazi Germany to the United States and then led a quiet, non-political life as a social worker in New York. But Mario Kessler has confirmed, and this is, I think, one of the most important findings of his research, that it was the intersection of the political and the personal, the murder of the love of her life, her husband, Arkady Maslow, in Havana by Stalin's agents, that crystallized the doubts and the second thoughts she must have been having and pushed her into active opposition to communism. Love and anger at Maslow's murderer are at the center of this story of de-radicalization, made all the more painful by the fact that it was her own brothers, Gerhard and Hans, who had given Soviet agents information about her husband's whereabouts. 
The work of Harvey Clare, John Haynes, Ronald Radosh, and Alan Weinstein have conclusively demonstrated the extent of Soviet espionage in the United States in the years before, during, and after World War II. The argument is over. We have known for some time now that because the U.S. government had access to Soviet communications to its agents in this country, the FBI was able to assess the validity of the testimony that Fisher was providing about the activities of her brothers and others. And based on recent scholarship, the main outlines of Fisher's testimony about Soviet espionage have proven to have been reliable, even as some of her exaggerations went beyond the evidence. Like Whitaker Chambers, she knew a very great deal from personal experience. Like him, she offered truthful testimony about people to whom she had been very close. Just as Chambers' testimony about his former friend, Aldra Hiss, turned out to be true, so did Fisher's testimony about her brothers. I hope that the larger biography in which today, from which today's talk comes will tell us more about Ruth Fisher, the political intellectual and contemporary historian. What was her interpretation of German communism in the 1920s? What were her reassessments of her own role? We know she criticized Soviet influence on German communism. What did she have to say about her own role? about communism itself, about her own stupidities. Why, in addition to the attacks on her husband and on her, did she turn against communism? The balance about Ruth Fisher, thus, would appear to be very mixed. She was one of those communists who helped to weaken the Weimar Republic when it needed friends. As head of the Copy Day, she lent what prestige that office had to gutter anti-Semitism. From the material Mario Kessler has presented, it is not apparent that she reassessed those views. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, she was able to distinguish truth from lies regarding the operations of the common turn in Germany and in the United States. She spoke the truth when it must have been very difficult to do so, having lived her early adulthood in the realm of communist politics. Receiving thank yous from the FBI and HUAC or Richard Nixon was probably not the kind of thing she most wanted to receive. <clears throat> so, I'm repeating myself a little bit, but Fisher's, Fisher's story is not, uh, at least from what we've heard today, one of deep political insight, um, agonizing reassessment. It is not a story that intellectual historians can pour over as they would over other figures who have traced the path of de-radicalization or radicalization and de-radicalization. Rather, her emphatic truth-telling in the late 1940s offers an example of how love, passion, personal interest contributed to truth-telling. We know that deep involvement may cloud objectivity, but there are cases in which partisanship and truth coincide. Fisher's partisanship was not to an ideal or an ideology of any sort in the late 40s, communist or anti-communist. From Kessler's account, her partisanship was to Arkady Maslow. In the age of ideologies and loyalties to abstraction and political murder in the name of abstractions, Fisher's testimony about her brothers and the common turn in the United States offered a striking example in which the fusion of the personal and the political became associated with opposition to totalitarianism rather than to its normal operations. Thank you very much. Mario, did you want to uh, comment on the commentary? <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, please, uh, please allow me to make a big uh, thing uh, short. Um, um, it was it, it was uh, it was my proposal uh, to invite uh, Jeff Herf as a, a commentator, um, given his integrity and his ability as a historian, and also given his his, uh, his uh, critical view no? on the uh, on the highways and byways of communism in the 20th century. When I started this biography, um, I wanted to portray 
not an overall positive picture of Ruth Fisher. I think that is that is clear, but a picture that is 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 more nuanced than um, than it was um, portrayed not only in the East German and in the Russian literature or in the Soviet literature, but also in most of the uh, but but also in most of the Western um, Western publications about her. Uh, now I see that uh, Jeff Herf um, um, sees uh, sees her um, morally, yeah, in a let's say in an, um, let's say in a um, slightly more positive light than I do. Why he asks a le legitimate question: Was she of that intellectual uh, of, of an intellectual format? And he places her in a rank with Kostler and Aron. Uh, or he asks this question: Can she be placed? And she said, and 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 he said, no. I would agree. That is was not uh, uh, primarily her intellectual merit, which um, um, which led me to the idea to write her biography. Uh, the first I, uh, the first reason for writing her biography was uh, there is no sufficient one. Yeah, and since she was the only person who was uh, 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 and also the only woman who was in the uh, both on the Hitler's first list of expatriates. And also to be uh, to, to be accused on the uh, likewise accused in the first Moscow trials, she must have been of some importance for her enemies. Yeah, and I think this is and I think this is uh, this is obvious. Uh, now I do not make a comment on Jeff's uh, on on Jeff's um, profound uh, comment. It would be too long. Certainly, I left all the I left all the passage on anti-Semitism out for 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 time reasons. Yeah. This and many other things you may find in the book in great detail. Um, there is a temporary problem. The temporary problem is I write this book in German, but, 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 uh, uh, I'm already I'm already looking and I'm already uh, begging for um, for um, uh, for money that it could be translated uh, trans, uh, translated into English. J. Edgar Hoover is dead. I cannot ask him anymore. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, so just two uh, just um, just two uh, brief um, um, brief um, remarks. Uh, I agree. Certainly, I agree with Jeff when he said Ruth Fischer and the KP and the KPD and the KPD in general. I would say not in particular, but in general, attacked German democracy when it was needed when it had needed support at most. I would go even further. Ruth Fischer and Maslow were instrumental in destroying the only democratic project in which the communists in the Weimar Republic had ever participated. This was the idea of the workers' government in Thuringia and in Saxony. This project was likewise attacked from the right-wing social uh, uh, democrats among Friedrich Ebert. Yeah? But it was but if 1939, um, unlike Otto Rosenberg, thought that Germany was not mature for a socialist revolution, but Germany was mature for a workers' government, which was far of having been having transformed Germany uh, to a socialist dreamland, but would would have made, let's say, um, 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 give way to a pol to, to a policy um, much more in favor of the. Of the of the proletarian of the workers than the actual policy of the German uh, central government and the German Länder government did, uh, the ultra leftist communists and the right wing social democrats likewise um, destroyed this project. And hein and and Heinrich Brandler, I don't think he was a he, he was a great strategist in German Communist Party, but he was one of the first who who got the idea. That it makes sense for the communists, even for even for their for their own interests, uh, to defend German democracy. Otherwise, otherwise he would not have been the founder of the KPO in 1921-29, which explicitly denounced the KPD's negative attitude to the Weimar Republic. This is, of course, something which I will discuss in my book in great in great detail, but it will not give um, um, much positive judgment about uh, about um, Ruth Fischer. The last thing, and here I beg you to wait till the book comes out. Yeah? Uh, I'm I give a very tentative answer to this question. Did Gerhard and Hans Eisler forward the relevant information to the Soviets? My answer so far is surprisingly not. I also, uh, I'm on the track to 
to find out who gave the information. Yeah? Uh, as far as far as I know so far, yeah, it was one prominent American socialist, the only American socialist who Fisher ever trusted. And please allow me to keep the name for myself till the book comes out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say here, here, as far as I can see, after reading a lot of sources in English, Rus uh, yes, English, Russian, and German, <coughs> I would say. Um, Whatever Gerhard and Hans Eisler made it, and Gerhard, of course, more than Hans, Hans was never a member of the party. Whatever, whatever Gerhard did, as far as I can see it so far, uh, he, has not, uh, he, did, uh, he was not actively involved in harming his sister by giving information about, uh, about uh, Maslow. But here, of course, um, uh, something, is, uh, something is still tentative. We have to wait. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, this book will be, in a way, a double, bi a double biography. I was asked to write a biography of the three siblings, which I cannot, uh, simply because uh, you have to include Hans Eisler. And, and, and for an understanding of Hans Eisler, you have, you have to have a profound knowledge of modern avant-garde music, which I do not have. Yeah? Certainly, uh, no, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a real reason. And, uh, uh, and there are good and solid biographies both about Hans Eisler and the recent biography about Gerhard Eisler, which is a little bit too positive, but, that's, um, but, but nevertheless a good biography. And there is, um, and, um, and, among, and, and when we see um, um, Ruth Fischer, yeah? certainly, certainly it will be a double biography with her and with her partner Maslow. Given all his political sectarianism in the, 19 in the 1920s, yeah? Uh, one has to say Maslow, Arkady Maslow in the 1930s was one of the first, and even before Ruth Fischer, to develop a fully understanding what Stalinism means. First of all, because his, his, his mother tongue was Russian. He knew Russian. He knew the Soviet leadership very well. And then he still, till the very end of his life, he remained a devoted socialist, yeah? a devoted leftist, yeah? Maybe, um, maybe I, I, would not, I would not say a communist, but somebody strong devoted to the cause, uh, which once was on, on, the, on the origins of the communist movement without, without his killing. And I hope in my book also to say something more about, I said here, yeah, uh, the, about his uh, circumstances, yeah, because I found out something, some surprising new, surprising new details, and uh, even more than details. Um, one can say without her killing, I mean, Fischer would have been a different person. She was broken. Basically, she never recovered from it. And I, I mean, I do not give any excuse for what she did under McCarthyism. In this, Jeff, in this Jeff, I, stay, I, I, re I remain more critical than you are. Yeah? Even, even, if I, even if I understand why she did so? Because, because I mean, it was it it was dangerous nonsense. Her brother had never anything anything to do with the murder of Bukharin. He had never anything to do with uh, with uh, Stalin's um, 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 with Stalin's transfer of communists from uh, Stalinist Russia to uh, to Germany. Stalin certainly did not need Gerhard Eisler. Had Stalin had Gerhard Eisler been in the Soviet Union at this time, he would have been killed by him. Uh, by by himself. So here I have to make a lot of critical remarks. Never was uh, never was uh, Erika Mann an American a, a Soviet agent. She was an FBI agent, as we know since recently. Uh, nor was Alfred Kantorovich an agent. Yeah. I I I stop here. Yeah. Good. We can open the the floor to questions now from the audience. Yeah, Vlad. If you could wait till the microphone gets to you, and also introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Vladimir Tismanian, University of Maryland. Thank you very much for this uh, mm -hmm. excellent presentation. Uh, just uh, two or three questions. Uh, first, uh, was there an attempt by uh, the NKVD to get rid of her as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and if not, why was Maslow more uh, dangerous than Ruth Fisher? Because, uh, huh? okay, I'm not going to elaborate. Okay. okay. First, uh, second, did she ever meet, and it's my ignorance here, did she ever meet and had any kind of connection with uh, Whitaker Chambers? With, with whom? Whitaker Chambers. Oh, Whitaker Chambers, yeah. Okay. Whitaker Chambers, okay. Uh, 
and third, during her time in Paris, either in the 30s or in the 50s, did she have any connection to Boris Sovarin? Okay. okay. These are the questions. Um, Thank you. Um, Mulțumesc, domnul Tismaniano. I... Uh, no, no, no. Um, uh, um, it's let my put him. Huh? <laughs> okay, so... Um, Shall I, shall we collect or shall I answer in brief? I answer in, I answer in brief. By the way, by the way, the NKVD question that is what I'm asking myself. Um, at the moment, I think Maslow became dangerous to the NKVD when he, when, uh, when um, in the back of J. Edgar Hoover, a group of, a group of um, FBI. FBI officials against against Hubers will decided to strongly cooperate with ex-communists. They thought the most reliable sources are ex-communists, and we take and we take into account that they are socialists, that they uh, that uh, and, and they have and, and they can remain socialists, but we need their expertise. Yeah, uh, between one of these uh, liaison officials at Maslow, there was a correspondence which by another man, I, whose name I do not mention now, was transferred to Moscow, obviously, and then the decision to kill Moscow, Maslow fell in the end of 1941, and he was soon, ex and, and he was soon killed in Havana. So much, I can, so much I can say. Maslow always remained more, uh, remained more dangerous because, uh, because of his intimate knowledge of the Russian Communist Party as a Russian, as a Russian born. Um, Fischer, Fischer feared to be, um, to be killed by the, um, by the uh, Soviets, but as far as I can see, there was, as far as I can see, there was never any attempt. Um, Whitaker Chambers, uh, whom I do not place, uh, whom I do not place very high. He was a diehard Stalinist, and then he was a diehard anti-communist of the worst type, I have to say. Um, Fischer, which is very interesting, Fischer refrained from having any contact to, uh, with him. She highly, esti she highly estimated Boris uh, Suvarin, whom she knew, whom she knew from the uh, from the 1930s. There was a, there was a, there was a circle, uh, there was a circle uh, around her to which, uh, to which briefly Suvarin and for a much longer time uh, Ante Zilika, uh, Ante Zilika belongs. The story between her and uh, her and Zilika will be explained uh, um, uh, very much in extensive in her life. But she had, but she had a Romanian contact in the last years of her life, and this was Lucien Goldman. Lucien Goldman, uh, when she returned to, let's say, to left-wing, uh, left-wing, uh, left-wing approaches, uh, she gave she gave at the Sorbonne, she gave uh, graduate uh, graduate seminars, and Lucien Goldman um, uh, was was uh, one of her uh, students uh, there. Yeah, so much. Say it again. She was my aunt's first husband. Oh, mm, ha -ha. I cannot compete. <laughs> okay, thanks. Vice. <laughs> Sonia Michelle from the Wilson Center. Um, two, qu two questions or two points. Yes. First, to underscore Jeffrey's um, interpretation, I wonder if you would agree with this, Mario, that uh, love was really, really very much drove her ideology at different points because if, if I understood you correctly, at the end she became, she went back to communism because she wanted to be able to make contact with her brothers, brother, yep. brothers in East Germany. So it seemed, that seems to be a consistent theme in her in her uh, in her biography, I wonder if you would agree with that. The other question is has to do with gender. You mentioned that she was one of the few women who was in such a prominent position, and of course, when we mm -hmm. think about women in communism, Rosa Luxemburg's name always always and almost only comes to mind, and there aren't that many others. So I wonder to what extent was it unusual? You know, how how can you explain the fact that as a woman she became uh, head of the KPD? Was you know was that unusual? Uh, on the one hand, did it did it give her prominence? On the other hand, did it make mm. her more vulnerable? Or and, and and in other parts of her biography, do you see gender playing mm, a role? Okay. And also, you mentioned that she had a son. You didn't tell us when he was born or under what and who's who was the father and under what circumstances did she have childcare? How did she manage to uh, mm. carry out her career when she had a child? Um, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you very much. It was obviously uh, there, there. There was a time frame, yeah. So I mean, uh, I will tell. I will uh, go, I will answer, or I will deal with all this question profoundly. Yeah? 
in the in the in the book but uh, since i already s uh, spoke of 43 instead of 40 minutes yeah so i broke my i i, I broke my promise i had to be i had to be short uh, but that's why what the discussion is for uh, ruthie ruthie and her brothers uh, when uh, when she was young yeah when she was in in their child they played uh, they they played and so and those of you a little bit familiar with german culture uh, ludger kunhardt just left um know uh, know something about the nibelung saga siegfried grimhild and Sieg and uh, grimhild's uh, uh, brothers she accuses the brother of having killed um, of of having killed siegfried and then the brothers are um, and then she makes many attempts to kill the brothers yeah i mean i mean certainly 20th century communism is might be far apart from the nibelungen saga uh, but certainly uh, but as you may imagine this all came to came to my mind um uh, in the for over for over 15 years she referred to her brothers as her ex-brothers and uh, and and likewise um, um, Gerhard and uh, Hans and, and Hans Eisler spoke about her unsere gewesene Schwester our former sister yeah certainly certainly her brothers were very much surprised by her last political turn yeah that one can say yeah and and this um, um, uh, this has also something to do with my son, with her son, which I will uh, uh, I will go to it in a in a um, in, in one minute. Gender in question. Certainly, certainly, she was the only woman to chair a European mass party. Rosa Luxemburg had been the chair of the Communist Party of Germany, but she was killed after two weeks, and the German Communist Party, the Spartacus Bund, was a little group which was not a mass party as a KPD under Ruth Fischer with uh, 140,000 members certainly was. Yeah, um, And Ruth Fischer I mean, she uh, she was uh, she briefly worked in the secretariat in the, uh, of the of the KPD when she started. She wrote her MA thesis on uh, on uh, on uh, sexual ethics in communism, sexual ethics in communism, uh, very much a gender issue at uh, at this time. She was uh, she was um, she was firmly uh, she was uh, she was firmly opposed to a men women model role and even if and and even if i will not discuss this in great detail her love affairs yeah in the in the, in the very beginning in the very beginning even even in the first one two years with maslow yeah she, they said uh, we uh, we do not we do not take care of bourgeois conventions everybody has his or her own, own right to have uh, love affairs outside yeah and both and both had she by the way with some um, with uh, some uh, prominent uh, German communist but I but, but I'm discreet and will even not write it in the book to the dismay of some of my readers I know this <laughs> yeah um, uh, and 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 she was and and certainly the women's question she wrote about she she wrote about the women's question she emphasized as uh, her her relationship to Clara Zetkin was not very friendly yeah um, her son Gerhard yeah uh, um, Paul Friedlander her uh, her briefly husband was the father of the son he was brought to he was brought to England he had an Austrian passport. Um, and here I and and here I tell a story which uh, which I never wrote until now, but which come which comes in the book. Uh, her son was tortured by an by an SR officer and his unit. They wanted to to know where she is from him in 1933, which he did not know. Yeah, 20 years later, 20 years later, this the same SR officer uh, wrote her. Uh, um, wrote to her, of course, uh, not uh, not covering his own identity, to let's say to bring her closer to the West German government-sponsored anti-communist network. This, by the way, which I did not uh, mention here, yeah. This was a deep shock. It shocked her. She was trembling. She was until then, until 1951. She was convinced anti-Semitism had run its course. She was convinced the German would have uh, uh, the Germans had learned the lesson. She was also, she was also gave credit to the West German democracy. Yeah? This was gun. Yeah? She, because a little later, a little later she received, a little later she, she received all the letters which made it impossible for her to get compensation. While the men who had tortured her son um, um, 
and um, um, and who was uh, who was an who was a highly officer in uh, Roland Freisler's so-called People's Court, the highest Nazi uh, the, high, the highest Nazi court. Yeah, and it was also impossible for sentencing to that uh, one of Richard uh, of Ruth Fischer's close friends in Paris, Helmut Glatz. Yeah, she was. This was such a shock. Since then, she never trusted the G West German political order anymore. Yeah, yeah? I uh, I just say it to you, and this has something to do, and this was one of the, this was one of the points what brought her back to m maybe to a naive belief that there was more potential reform in the Soviet Union than in the West. This was a naive belief, as we know now. Yeah? But at least as a biographer, I have to, I have to give you this detail. And, and, and I give her give now. Her son never set foot on Germany. Her son never wanted to speak German. Yeah? Uh, this torture, as if when a 15 year man, man, uh, young man is tortured, yeah, it also destructed his life. We ha and, and, and we have to take this into account. There's one more question in the back of the room. Oh. Maybe we'll take two quick questions. Three. Yeah, please. You, you briefly mentioned uh, Louis Boudin's testifying uh, at the hearing of her brother. Uh, he has a reputation of someone who knew some things but who elaborated mm -hmm. beyond what he knew or, or had ever experienced. Uh, wondered if that was the case in his testimony in, this, in, the, in that case, or uh, can you say mm -hmm. anything about that? And uh, can I, can we have one more? Yeah, yeah please. We, we, con we connect. We collect, yeah. Budenz, okay. Yeah, I'm Don Wolfensberger with the uh, Wilson Center. I was wondering whether you can identify any single source that would be the greatest influence in her early life as to why she became an authoritarian communist and what she feared most about a uh, yeah. democratic variation on that. Okay. Uh, in brief, yeah, given the uh, given the time is running out, Budenz, I. I'm sorry to say, but I found uh, Budin's book uh, much weaker than her book on, Germ um, um, on uh, Stalin and German communism. Even if her book came almost simultaneously out with another book, the KPD in the Weimar Republic, which was written by Osip Flechtheim. On Flechtheim, I wrote a, I wrote a book. I must not say uh, much now. Uh, he was also a victim of McCarthyism. Flechtheim, um, Flechtheim's book, which was translated into any major language but into English, yeah? Um, um, surpassed her book and surpassed the whole, uh, surpassed the whole um, contemporary literature on uh, communism. While Budenz, I mean, I mean, Budenz, I mean, uh, look, I mean, these all these mediocre characters here, and and here in 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 the case of Budenz, I cannot say anything, I cannot say anything positive. Only, only that the only that the that these. To quote Isaac Deutscher's people like him, and I would say also to Whitaker, Whitaker Chambers, they remain inverted Stalinists. Yeah, uh, they uh, they did not they did they did even not consider to become Democrats. They worked in America. I mean, also Ruth Fischer did. Yeah, she worked with people which I cannot consider as Democrats, who were racist, who supported who, su who supported uh, Franco, um, who despised the African Americans, on and on and on. These are um, these are not Democrats. I'm sorry to say. And last, what? Why she became so? Yeah. Here we have. Thank you for the question. We have to take into account and once again take into account the First World War. This was a generation for which the First World War delegitimized the bourgeois order, parliaments, the social democracy, not at least the churches. Yeah, this, this, uh, I mean, this unpredictable slaughter, this boundless nationalism. Yeah, after that, after that, people deserted to communism, which under other, which under other conditions would have been, let's say, moderate social democrats. But there was no room for it, yeah. Since the social democracy in all countries, yeah, became uh, became became even uh, sometimes even more bloodthirsty than the than the former right wing nationalists. I'm sorry to say this in brief, but this, of course, um, um, uh, plays um, plays an important role when I go into the biography in in her early years. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm afraid we've run out of time, but um, uh, thank you very much for to both of you for sort of giving us a great overview of a life mm -hmm. that seems to echo. Sure echo the, the tumult of the, of the history of the times as well. Um, so please join me in thanking um, our two speakers.